Hello, I'm Amanda Moore. I'm the director of the Clearinghouse Community. Welcome to the Advocacy Exchange. This is our monthly conversation with advocates advancing change. Now, the Advocacy Exchange is a new term for us. Um, for those of you who have been around for a while, you may know this. It's like the artist formerly known as our Shriver Hangouts. Um, it's just the same. We've only changed the name. So both the Advocacy Exchange and the Clearinghouse Community are brought to you by the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law, a national leader in advancing justice and opportunity. Today in the Advocacy Exchange, we are speaking with a panel that is chock full of expertise. I'm so pleased to have them with me. Um, we have five guests today. Um, we're going to uh, talk today about about um, this anniversary, the 20th anniversary of welfare reform, and look ahead to where we need to go from here. Um, I'm so pleased to have these five with me. Um, they all know a lot about this topic. I'll introduce them to you now. Um, I'll start with Ann Erickson. Ann is the president and CEO of the Empire Justice Center, and Ann is joining us today from Albany, New York. Hi, Ann. Hi, everybody. Nice to be here. We also have Elizabeth Lauer Bash. She is the Director of Income and Work Supports at CLASP, the Center for Law and Social Policy. And Elizabeth is joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Elizabeth. Hello. And we have Jim Weil. Jim is the President of the Food Research and Action Center, also joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Jim. Hey, everyone. Hey, Amanda. And we have Mark Cohen, director, the executive director of the National Center for Law and Economic Justice. Mark is joining us from New York City. Hi, Mark. Hi there. And last but not least is my colleague, Wendy Pollack. And Wendy's the director of the Women's Law and Policy Project at the Shriver Center. And Wendy joins us today from Chicago. Hi, Wendy. Hi. So all my guests um, were contributors to our current Clearinghouse article. Um, it's called 20 Years After Welfare Reform, Reflections and Recommendations from Those Who Were There. And this is sort of a, a, a non-traditional Clearinghouse article for us, but it's, it's really great. It's a compilation of 13 shorter pieces, each one examining a particular angle of welfare reform. Um, I highly recommend that you check it out. Um, you can find the article here um, at www.povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. Um, unlike our usual clearinghouse articles, we've made this one available to you without registering on the site, so um, I encourage you to check that out. Before we get started talking um, about welfare reform today, I want to let you know how you can be part of this conversation. We would really love to hear from you with your questions or your comments. Um, I know that you're watching us in a couple different ways, and there are a couple different ways you can um, let us hear from you. One is if you're watching through the Hangout itself, you can use the Q&A app. Um, you can hover the mouse over the left side of your screen and you'll see a blue box that says Q&A. Click that and you'll have a chat box open down the right side of your screen. You can submit your questions to us that way. Um, don't worry, we won't see your face. Uh, we won't hear you. Um, we'll just see your question. If you want to go ahead and try it out now, feel free. You can just send us your name and where you're watching. Um, some of you I know are watching this as a live stream through the Shriver Center's YouTube channel. We want to hear from you too. Um, you can send me an email while we're talking. Here's my email address on the screen. It's Amanda Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at povertylaw.org. Um, I have my trusty dual monitor here and I'll be watching for your emails as we talk. One more thing, um, because this is such a broad topic and because we have five guests here who know so much that uh, we want to hear, we've decided to extend our time today for the Hangout. Um, normally we do this as 30 minutes, we're going to extend it to 45 minutes today. Don't panic um, if you don't have enough time to stay with us. Everyone who registered for today's um, event will get a follow-up email with a link to a recording of today's Hangout. So you can just go to that and pick up where you had to leave, um, leave off. Um, that, that email will also include a link to um, the link that's on your screen so you can read their article. Um, without further ado, oh, we have a few people who are saying hello to us. We've got Jacqueline in Chicago and Pamela in Hampton, Virginia. Um, I think there's some more, but I will check those in a minute. I want to jump on into why you're all here, which is to talk about welfare reform. 
We're um, going to talk a little bit about 1996, but really we want to look ahead and talk about where we need to go from here. Um, Mark, I'd like to start with you. Sure. Um, give us sort of, so we're all on the same page, even though we want to talk about the future, let's make sure we all have a basic understanding of what happened in 1996. Can you summarize briefly for us what the, the main changes were that were brought about by welfare reform in 1996? Sure. The changes basically had several elements. There were major structural legal changes that eliminated what had been basically a program that assured that aid to families with dependent children was provided to needy families throughout the country. And it was a mandatory program and it had no time limits. It had work obligations and other requirements and there were income eligibility guidelines. But what made it unique, it was the only national program that assured that if people met certain thresholds based on need, they would be provided with cash assistance necessary to pay for things like rent, electricity, um, food, clothing, and other necessities. That was replaced with a block grant that basically provides that the state has can limit or eliminate completely the uh, obligation to provide cash assistance to families in need. So the most important structural change is the elimination of an obligation to provide aid to the needy in this country. If a state chooses to provide aid to the needy under the TANF block grant, it, is li it can limit the assistance provided to as few as a month, but in any event, no more than 60 months. There were also built-in requirements of work obligations that imposed on the states a requirement of enrolling or registering certain numbers of certain percentages on an increasing basis of families into the work programs, a variety, 12 different work activities. As a practical matter, a number of states chose to instead reduce the welfare roles as an alternative to actually providing work opportunities to needy families. Those were some of the sort of structural changes that are the highlights. The program has had many other features that were really adverse to the interests of low-income people. What the consequences of those changes were and that played out over time have been a complete uh, decimation of public benefit programs, the provision of cash assistance across the country. As we sit here today, New York State remains the only state that has a guaranteed ob an obligation to provide aid to the needy unequivocally and it's built into the New York State Constitution. The other 49 states do not have that obligation. So what you have seen, and others will talk about this in greater detail, is that for the bottom quintile of our population, the need has become more profound in the assistance provided to that population has decreased dramatically. There are states that use this as an opportunity to go after the provision of public benefits or cash assistance and an example of that would be Georgia, where the cash assistance roles were reduced to virtually non-existent. A number of other states, cash assistance is basically a program that provides aid to children-only households, and no cash assistance is, for all intents and purposes, provided to families with, ad with adults, only to the needy children. Other states have gone in the direction of imposing incredibly harsh uh, lifetime time limits of 18 months, 24 months, in some instances 30 months. So we've seen the outcome have been the kind of race to the bottom that we anticipated and it's all based on these structural changes of block granting, lifetime limits, work activities, and incentives that motivate states to at the end of the day r take people off the rolls rather than to move them into welfare to work activities. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Anne, I'd like to turn to you. Your piece in the compilation that's on the Clearinghouse article brought this really interesting state-level perspective. So, you know, we hear a lot about what was going on in Washington, D.C. at the time. Can you give us a summary of what it was like in the states in 1996 when welfare reform was happening? Certainly. Thanks, Amanda. And um, thanks to Shriver for doing this. I really, um, it's not exactly a, a, an anniversary we are we are celebrating, but I think taking a moment to um, to reflect on on where we were and kind of regroup about where we go is is important. Um, you know, so 20 years ago, if if folks remember, or maybe some of you weren't there, 
um, there was a whole anti-poverty movement going on um, around the country, and Newt Gingrich and uh, Rush Limbaugh and others had really taken to the airwaves and had been really using a, a grassroots approach to beat the drum about um, no more entitlements and no more welfare and no more helping each other and we've got to have time limits and it, it was just this constant drumbeat where entitlement became such a bad word and um, at the state level it was really scary once Bill Clinton signed welfare reform ending welfare as we know it um, it really devolved very quickly to the state levels and for the first time we were really looking at um, the, the loss of our federal underpinnings, the loss of federal protections, the loss of the federal entitlement, the loss of some, some basic federal guidelines that as Mark said, you know, if people met these standards they would be um, entitled to certain supports and assistance. Um, all of that was unraveling under our feet and uh, at the state level for the first time state legislators needed to really start understanding what this all meant and um, there was certainly again that that swell of this is a good thing we got rid of the entitlement and one of the things we did was really go almost door to door but we held we held weekly briefing briefings with the um, in, within the legislative office building open to anybody to come in to just say this is really what it means I may be losing my entitlement but you the state of New York you're losing your federal guarantee if I'm entitled to federal benefits you're guaranteed federal payments and it, it was a um, you know, again, a, a shifting of the sands underneath our feet. And so for the um, advocates who were working on behalf of, of recipients and, and those um, in low income, it was one thing to come at it from the personal perspective and what it was going to mean to those individuals and families going forward. But we also wanted the state to understand what it was going to mean to the state and to the state federal financial relationships. So that was a really big um, change. The, um, as Mark said, in New York State, we do have a constitutional obligation to provide care and assistance to the needy. People often forget that comma, you know, in such manner and by such means as the legislature shall from time to time determine. And the state legislature was about to make some pretty significant determinations. And so state level advocacy became really important, getting up to speed on what all the changes meant, what the work rules meant. The participation rates were a big thing. All of a sudden, the federal participation rates of who had to be participating in activities, what the definition of activities meant, what childcare was going to look like, what kind of supports were going to get wrapped around. Um, so we were moving forward with changing state law, waiting for the federal regulations, trying to educate the legislature about what they could do, um, what they had to do, what they were allowed to do. Yes, you can be as, um, you know, mean and, and harsh and, you know, stingy as you want, that, you know, the federal protections really are not there anymore, but you're not required to be. The state can do better, and that was a big message. Um, it was a very intense year, you know, the federal stuff passed in 96, our state law passed almost a year later to the date in 97, um, and the federal regulations came out. It, it was just a, a constant, um, you know, challenge to keep up on top of things. And I have to say the federal partners, our national partners at CLASP and uh, Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, you know, thank God that they were there in D.C. feeding us, you know, what the different changes were and how the state could maneuver around them if the state so chose. And mm -hmm. it was our job to get the state to choose. So it right. was amazing. Well, thank you, Mark and Ann, for taking us back 20 years, reminding us what was going on. Um, Elizabeth, I'll turn to you now. Ann just mentioned the um, assistance that CLASP has and the expertise there in D.C. So let's go from the past to the present, and then we'll move on to the future. But if you could tell us now, how has all this we've just heard about, how has it played out, where has it brought us to at this moment? Sure. So can you hear me first? Yes. Okay, just checking since sure. we had some technical sure. issues before. 
So as you've heard from the others, the biggest change was just how much of the power was shifted to the states. And so the result is that tariff looks very different from state to state. States always under AFDC set the benefit levels, but now there's far more variation in time limits, in sanction policies, in what work activities are countable. So it really ranges from a state like California or New York where a significant share of low-income families with children still receive benefits to some states where really cash assistance almost doesn't exist. So there's a lot of variation from state to state. Overall, the caseloads, the number of people, families receiving assistance is way lower than it was in 1996. And Shockingly, during the recession, which was the deepest recession in certainly my lifetime and many of our lifetimes, in many states, TANF caseloads did not go up, um, even in the recession. Some states it was more responsive, um, but certainly not responsive compared to food stamps or SNAP or other programs. Um, the other thing to note, which others have said, is that about half the cases now are what's called child only, which means either that it's a grandparent caring for children, um, or the parent has reached a time limit and lost benefit for those reasons, or maybe the parent's um, ineligible because of having come to the country more recently. Many even legal immigrants are denied access to benefits. So these are cases where the children are getting benefits but the adults are not. So it's really a dramatically smaller program. And actually just listening to talking about the advocacy effort 20 years ago, one of the effects really has been that I do think the anti-poverty community spends less of its energy thinking about TANF these days because it does reach a smaller share of the population. Thank you, Thank Elizabeth. You, Elizabeth. Um, I want to remind want to everyone, remind everyone. Oh, Elizabeth, can you go back on mute? Back on mute? Sure. Thank you. I was getting some echo. Um, I want to remind all our viewers that um, we welcome your questions now, and um, you can send those either through the Q&A app or email me here at Amanda Moore at PovertyLaw.org. I also want to say hello to Linda in Pittsburgh, who let us know that she's watching. Wendy, I'll turn to you now. Your piece in the Clearinghouse article focused on a particular slice of welfare reform and served as a really good reminder to us that there's a large overlap between our client population that was affected by welfare reform and the client population that's affected by domestic violence. So you talked about the family violence option. Could you tell us a little bit about what that is and what your recommendations are as we sort of pivot now and look forward as to um, where, how you think we can strengthen that? Sure. So um, back to 96 and actually pre-96 as we were looking at how all these requirements are coming, you know, the time limits and the, and the work requirements um, and researchers here mainly in Chicago but also throughout the country were, you know, showing that uh, up to, you know, three quarters of the population of you know, the AFDC population were survivors of domestic violence. You know, they had some history of violence in their lives, whether it was current or in the past. Um, and we know that uh, domestic violence makes you poor and keeps you poor. So, you know, uh, us, those of us who uh, uh, work on the Violence Against Women community, we were very concerned about this, and that resulted in the drafting of the uh, family violence option. So what it's supposed to do is, and, and in, we couldn't get it to be a mandate, so it is an option, but most states have adopted some form of it. Um, so the provisions are that they're supposed to screen applicants uh, for domestic violence and maintain confidentiality, make referrals to counseling and other support services, and then, if appropriate, to make waivers of any, uh, um, of any TANF requirement, whatever it is. What most states have done who have adopted it have basically made the, the waiver only related to um, the work requirements and possibly the, the uh, the lifetime limit, the 60-month uh, limit. Um, so the problem has been is that it's one of those things that, you know, I'm sure pe people in states across the, the country realize that nobody knows about it, nobody's told about it. So basically there are no, there's almost no recipients within the country who are actually receiving a waiver under the Family Violence Act. Now, some states or, or, or you know, counties or, you know, where however the, um, the programs are run in your, in your state, um, 
you know, they built it into their work requirements. They don't necessarily have to have a family violence option waiver because they kind of built that in and count those kinds of activities like counseling as part of the work requirements. But for most states, that's not true. Um, in our experience, certainly in Illinois, we don't think anybody is on it at this point. It has any kind of waiver because nobody's told about it, nobody's informed. And it's not just that, it's just that, you know, survivors have to make the decision of like, you know, a decision that they're making on behalf of themselves and their families about, you know, is it worth the risk to take a benefit when they might be then have to cooperate with the child support requirements or work activities or whatever activities they are required to take, uh, does this put them more at risk? Um, you know, is, is breaching that kind of confidentiality, sharing that information w worth the risk? And what we're finding in talking to uh, recipients, you know, currently is that most of them are making the decision that it's not worth the risk. Um, and the program tends to be fairly punitive all around and rather than being helpful, so why would they take that risk? Um, so in terms of, you know, how do we make it better, I mean, we know how to make it better. Uh, you know, one thing is, is pretty much, you know, making, making it a reality that this, this option will actually benefit you and so that, that the, you know, applicants and recipients understand what the, you know, what the family violence is, what it would, what, how it would benefit them, what they get out of it, um, how it will help them stabilize economically and hopefully advance um, and, and be able to leave um, assistance. Um, you know, procedures, protocols have to be consistent, they have to be followed through on, and real help needs to be there. You know, are they getting the counseling they need? Are they getting the relocation help they need? Are they, is the confidentiality really there? Are they not going to go after child support when it could put uh, the survivor and her family at risk? So those are the kinds of things that, you know, have to be done. Um, it's done maybe in a couple of states, but overall it's really not done in, in, uh, generally. And so you, there are really no numbers. I've, I've really checked it out uh, in terms of not only family violence option waivers, but waivers from the child support requirement altogether, the, the co you know, I'm waiver to cooperate in child support. And basically it, it, it's not existent. Thank you, Wendy. Um, and I want to let Randy know, I've got your question, Randy. I'm going to hold it. Um, we're going to talk about recommendations next, and then I will get back to your question. Jim, we have not heard from you yet. Um, your piece in the Clearinghouse article gave some concrete recommendations of where you think we need to go from here. And I'd like to hand this to you to let us um, start. You know, Now we are finally doing the pivot to the future, which Wendy started us on. What do we need to do now? Uh, so thanks, Amanda. Well, uh, we've we've been talking mostly about TANF, and uh, perhaps inappropriately, my recommendations for the future are ninety percent not about TANF. Uh, TANF is hugely important to low-income people, albeit much less so than AFDC was. But if we're going to meet the needs of low-income people, TANF is sort of the tail that shouldn't be wagging the income maintenance, income support. Uh, world, dog. Um, so where we really have to start is to make jobs and wages better uh, and make them a much more effective support. The TANF losses have occurred over the last 20 years during what's really a 40-year period of wage declines and other failures of the job market to meet the needs of the bottom third of, of families, less educated workers, younger workers, uh, workers of color meeting failing to meet their needs and their families' needs and TANF simply can't compensate for much of this. So the path forward first to have to has to be through jobs and wages. Higher unemployment higher employment rates, uh, more public employment, uh, even though uh, private employment has mostly recovered uh, since the height of the recession, we're down half a million public employment jobs. Those jobs are disproportionately held by people of color. Uh, that's been a, a real uh, blow to low-income workers and to people, uh, particularly workers of color. Uh, so we need more employment. We need a higher minimum wage, obviously. Uh, we need to enforce the laws that are already in effect, the minimum wage laws, the wage and hours laws. We need to end wage theft. People are losing billions of dollars to failure to enforce the existing wage and hour laws. Second, we need the range of public income supports outside of TANF to be strengthened. Um, 
uh, they've, they've, most of them have shrunk over the last 20 years at the same time that TANF support was shrinking. We need to strengthen unemployment insurance and workers' compensation. We need paid family leave. Uh, we need to strengthen Social Security as a support for people. Third, uh, we need to strengthen the Earned Income Tax Credit and the Child Tax Credit. There are a bunch of ways to do that. The Earned Income Tax Credit, for starters, needs to be improved for childless workers, something that's agreed to in theory by both um, Republican and Democratic members of Congress, uh, including Speaker Ryan, but uh, there's disagreement on how to pay for it. Uh, we need the child tax credit to be refundable from the first dollar of earnings, uh, as many of us have been arguing for the last 20 years or 16 years. Uh, as to TANF, um, others on this uh, hangout know more than I do about TANF. Um, TANF needs a range of reforms, but um, uh, the first crucial change is to require that some minimum share of TANF and state funds, state MOE funds, be spent on core activities like income support and not diverted to other purposes. And then lastly, as I talk about in my article, we have to learn the right lessons from TANF and, and the right lessons are that it's been a disaster and we have to make sure that attempts to do the same thing to SNAP and Medicaid, to block grant them or to impose spending caps don't succeed. Um, to SNAP and Medicaid have really filled some of the hole that the TANF disaster has created, as well as meeting the needs created by the recession and expanding because of the ACA and Medicaid. So they've become more and more important over the last 20 years as a key support for low-income families. And if we lose their entitlement status, that'll be a, a disaster many times larger than the TANF disaster has been. Jim, that's a, a good segue into a question that we had come in from uh, Randy, who's also in D.C., and she says, how is Speaker Ryan's Better Way, um, the new anti-poverty agenda, similar to the TANF recommendations from 20 years ago, and how is it different? Uh, well, uh, Speaker Ryan's recommendations uh, have uh, shifted a little bit from year to year, but basically over a period of several years now. He's proposed making these key entitlement programs into block grants, turning them back over to the states, um, imposing work tests, basically doing to SNAP and TANF and other pro uh, SNAP and Medicaid and other programs as well. Um, he's proposing bringing in the housing subsidy dollars and other dollars, making them look like TANF. And so presumably the people on this call know us better than anybody. Uh, what a nightmare that would be. So we've uh, worked hard, as have, I believe, everybody on this Hangout, to make sure that uh, Speaker Ryan's anti-poverty suggestions don't get much further. M much of his rhetoric is fine, rhetoric about uh, uh, building employment in um, uh, low-income communities and uh, is fine and uh, b better... Um, uh, individualizing some of the response to people's needs, um, but uh, cutting the heart out of these programs is not the way to help low-income people. We've had a question come in from uh, Raymond, and it's interestingly similar to a question that came in before the Hangout uh, from, um, I believe it was Ken, yes, Ken in Colorado. Um, and the question, Elizabeth, I will turn this one to you. Um, Many people are starting to express concern that we're heading toward a jobless economy. As a result, there's been renewed discussions of the idea of a universal basic income. I'm curious to know what the speakers think about this idea. And that was the same question that Ken had sent in before. Is there an opportunity for this basic income, um, a scheme like that, to replace benefits programs? So the problem with the idea that a basic income would replace the existing benefit programs is that without a massive infusion of additional dollars the numbers just don't work out that if you think about the whole population that to provide even a modest benefit you would lose key programs like SNAP, like Medicaid, as well as TANF so there's just not a reality there and people couldn't live on a $2,000 basic income, for example, so it wouldn't 
really be feasible as a solution for the very low end. That said, the notion that there should be minimum standards and that no one in this country should be in destitution is a very powerful one. And particularly so Jim's notion that the child tax credit should be fully refundable is in many ways a way to get towards, at least for children, a basic income or a child allowance, which most um, industrialized nations do offer. I don't know if anyone else wants to. Take a crack. Okay. Well, I, I just I, I, I think in, uh, if one looks at the most pessimistic projections and takes a long-term view, um, eventually employment rates or full-time employment rates are going to be considerably lower, particularly for less skilled workers than they even are now. And that's uh, something that the country is going to have to come to grips with in a positive way. <coughs> Excuse me, I have a cold. And um, it's up to those of us who work in this area and who know what's gone wrong to figure out how to carve out a better concept of how we're going to meet the needs of low income, underemployed, and unemployed people in this country over the next 20, 30 years, as well as the next year and five years. Right. Yeah, and this is Anne. I mean, I would just um, want to echo some of what Jim was saying in terms of the wage and justice issues that we really need to start tackling and, and looking at employment, you know, the kinds of employment opportunities we're going to have. Are they paying a decent wage? Are the workers protected? But I think also within the TANF content context, um, we really need to relook at how we're defining employability and what the expectations are there and is there any opportunity for education and advancement and what do we do with populations that are um, you know disabled but not with those such visible disabilities that we kind of meet people where they are and help them along and with that I think the, the core thing really becomes um, a lot of the, the communication and the discussion in this country or the lack of discussion about what it is we're doing uh, with those among us who need help and support. You know, we don't have a heavy anti-poverty conversation going on right now. Um, maybe we can get at it through some of the wage and justice issues and some of the, you know, meeting people where they are. But I, I think we've got to figure out how to engage the conversation differently and then the solutions may be more welcomed. And Amanda, if I may. Following up on both Jim's comment and Anne's comment and some of the other observations, I think moving forward, these 30,000 feet conversations are very important, but I think for a lot of the participants in this call, there's a lot of things that can be done now that have practical consequences for advocates, whether in restricted legal service programs, statewide programs, or at the federal level that we ought to be doing more of. I certainly agree with Anne's observation, for example, that we need to be doing a lot more education at the state level, at the state policy focus, and at the state partners to really help state legislators understand that when benefits are not available, the consequence not only hurts poor people, it also hurts the state budget, it hurts everybody, it hurts providers, it goes across the board. I also agree with Jim that we have to have a continued and strengthened focus of advocacy structured to get at questions of other benefit programs so that we have to really make sure that the full availability of food stamps, of Medicaid, of public housing, and whatever other program may be are fully being exploited to the maximum extent possible. I also would suggest though, and that's part of the center's advocacy agenda, it's part of what we try to do so we go after issues of food stamps, Medicaid, cash assistance, workers comp, worker justice, and everything else. But I would also suggest that one of the critical things that we need to focus on is that there are things that can be done at the grassroots level within the TANF program itself to provide greater protections. And those play out in a couple of different ways. First off, there are fundamental due process protections that can play out at administrative fair hearings and court cases. They don't have to be class actions for restricted programs. Great work was done in Colorado, in Arizona, in Missouri, and in Texas to protect 
fundamental TANF rights. Great work is, of course, being done in New York by Anne's program, the Legal Aid Society, and others to protect TANF rights. But we also have to accept the fact that TANF, to the extent that it exists as a program, other than children, the primary beneficiaries of TANF across the country tend to be people with disabilities. And there are tremendous opportunities under the Americans with Disabilities Act to identify litigation and administrative advocacy opportunities to protect persons with disabilities. And last but not least, because I know we're pressed for time, there are tremendous opportunities to also accept the fact that for a lot of TANF participants, the way the adults participate is through work activities, and to accept the fact that the government has placed, has acknowledged their role as workers, and to utilize worker protection and other statutory and regulatory opportunities to ensure that people who participate in TANF activities, whether it be work fair, community service, or other kinds of activities, receive the full benefit of the protections to which they're entitled. These are advocacy opportunities that can be done on a real level, but what it requires is that the legal service and legal aid programs across the country have to do what many of us observed are not happen is not happening, and that's re-inculcate a vigorous focus on TANF advocacy as part of their programs moving forward. And we would certainly be delighted to work with any office that is doing that. And this is Lindy. Um, I, I totally agree with uh, the previous comments. Um, but one opportunity, I work a lot on workforce development and employment issues. Um, and uh, uh, for many of you who uh, may be familiar with this, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act has been changed significantly to make sure that there's not as much creaming so that uh, lower skilled uh, folks can actually access training, and this is the main uh, funding federal dollars that go into that come down to the states in terms of uh, 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 you know occupational building skills that sort of thing. And so there's much more opportunity. At, you know, at, it was effective as of July of, of this year to engage TANF participants in WIOA programming, which will give a lot more opportunity than probably any state had, has given previously to TANF recipients in terms of, you know, opportunity to, to get some education and training skills. Uh, thank you, Raymond, for that question. It launched us into quite a good discussion. Um, Elizabeth, I'd like to turn back to you. My previous question had been to Jim because his, um, his co contribution to the Clearinghouse article laid out some very concrete recommendations. Yours did that as well, and I'd like to turn to you to see if you have things you would like to add to the recommendations that Jim made. Sure. So I completely endorse Jim's recommendations about the broader anti-poverty agenda. In my piece, I did focus on what could be done within TANF. And basically, I came up with three categories of changes that are needed. One is really about setting a standard, a baseline across states so that it can't keep going down and down. When TANF was created, there were huge fights over the fact that there was now a 60-month, a five-year federal time limit. Now Arizona has a 12-month time limit in a lifetime. So that just wasn't envisioned 20 years ago. And so I think really thinking about what's our minimum expectations across states. The second piece is around these work participation requirements, which is really the bad name, because it's really not about work. It's about tracking hours. It's about whether people show up and attendance is taken. And it's primarily about job search. To some extent, it's very little short-term training programs, by and large, things that might be 12 weeks, not real credentials that lead to good jobs. Um, so really sort of thinking about one of the incentives on states that encourage them to put people into lousy jobs rather than career jobs, the stuff that supported under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And then the third piece is really about following the money. So there's two problems. One is it's a block grant. It hasn't been increased in 20 years. So the real value after inflation has gone down by more than 30%. But it's worse than that because a lot of the money has been diverted. Um, 
I guess Jim said before, talking about how much of the money is going into core activities of cash assistance, work activities, and child care. That's only about 50% nationally, and there's a lot of states where it's much, much lower. Um, Georgia uses an awful lot of its kind of block grant for child welfare activities. Texas supports both child welfare and pre-kindergarten programs. And I'm not saying these aren't useful things to do with money, but it squeezes and squeezes kind of leaving less and less for cash assistance and even for work activities. Of course, on the amount of money that most states are spending on work activities, they're not connecting people to good jobs. There really needs to be an effort to provide states with the resources, but also make sure that they're spending it in good ways. Thank you, Elizabeth. We, uh, just to follow on to some of your recommendations, we had a couple of questions come in from Patricia that are asking for more information and you touched on both of these things. So if I could just ask you for resources really quickly in case other people are wondering this too. She had asked um, if cer these certain resources exist. One being, um, <clears throat> is there something that tracks the block grant funding and expenditures? Um, is there some place you can see that where different states are how they're using their block grant was one question and the second part was um, where can you see a comparative view of how um, different states have implemented uh, TANF? So great questions. So on the spending side the most recent data actually just was released from HHS this week. You can see it on the ACF Administration for Children and Families website and we also at CLASP have a blog post and in focus that discusses it and we'll be updating. We have a series of what we call TANF 101 briefs so if you're tuning in on this and a lot of what you're hearing is new and we're using jargon that's not familiar to you, these kind of 101 briefs are a great place to start and we will be updating those to reflect the newest data. Um, the state comparisons, um, to some extent probably the most useful resource on that is at the Urban Institute. There's something called the Welfare Rules Data Book that has about 200 pages of tables listing everything from time limits to benefit levels to sanctions to how, you know, step parent income is treated. So pretty far down into the weeds on that. That's great. Thanks for sharing this. Um, we are short on time, but we have some more questions, so I'm going to get in what we can get in before we have to wrap up. Um, two questions have come in. Um, interestingly, both are from Ohio, and they're taking kind of the big, um, I don't want to say political because it's broader than that, but sort of the big attitude view that we have right now. Um, one is, you know, what are we doing on a grassroots organizing level to reinstitute the true safety net? Um, and this is from Mark. He um, recalls going to national welfare rights organization meetings in the early 70s and feels like we've been on retreat from that ever since. Um, Stanley in Ohio had talked, brought up the point that um, while welfare reform hasn't reduced poverty, it's been so politically popular um, as I think think maybe it was Elizabeth earlier who mentioned um, even during the height of the recession nobody seriously considered suspending time limits. Um, seems like it's an issue no one really wants to embrace even though our economy is so different as you all have said today particularly with barriers to employment such as health, child care, lack of jobs for the least skilled. So we have these kind of big picture what can we do on this front to change this dynamic and this attitude that we have about a safety net? I, hi, this is Mark. I can't speak to the fully to the change of the dynamic because I think that's a longer term solution and it's going to require major political shifts in this country that we're not yet ready for. And I think that as people feel disenfranchised and afraid, they tend to blame others and I think there's still a tendency to blame the poor for their disenfranchisement and I think it's tied up in a whole variety of immigrant and racial questions that people are not yet ready to address and that's our current political climate but one thing that was raised is sort of where are the welfare rights organizers and why are they not playing poverty organizers at this moment and the short answer to that is there's a number of factors that have impacted but two of them are that the, a lot of the organizing movement 
has moved on to things such as low-wage work organizing, farm worker justice organizing, neighborhood organizing, housing organizing. There's a tremendous amount of effort around organizing, but the focus has shifted, in part because there's a recognition that the ability to affect change is limited. The other thing that's important is that the role of funders. A number of funders have, this was huge around when TANF was um, up for reauthorization. The funders were very much supporting a lot of grassroots organizing. A lot of that foundation support has disappeared and has been moved in other directions around other issues. So for the grassroots organizers, they no longer have the financial support necessary to make it this their focus. And again, the directions have changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, this is Anne. I would just add on the um, you know, welfare rights organizing. A lot of, um, when you talk about welfare rights, they're legal rights. And uh, one of the things that you know, we don't spend a lot of time on, but Mark alluded to it earlier, is that the year before uh, welfare reform, we had vast changes to the legal services uh, infrastructure in this country and the uh, elimination of all federal funding for state and national support centers and restrictions on what um, attorneys could do if they were federally funded and and I think that had a tremendous impact on the um, support and underpinnings in the legal infrastructure that had been available at the community level and I think we've got to be conscious about rebuilding some of that. And if I may just follow up on Anne's observation, the same attack that ultimately eviscerated some of the ability of the legal services community to use a variety of tools also effectively eviscerated some of the efforts at the low-income organizing. Just ask ACORN right. what happened to them in the, last, in the last election cycle. And ACORN had been one of the most effective national entities doing grassroots work around welfare rights and other poverty issues. And this is Jim. I, I would just add, uh, you know, I agree with what Mark and Ann have said about what's happened to welfare rights and low-income benefits organizing. I, I also think, uh, being a little Pollyannish, the glass is half full. If you look back over the last 20 years, the uh, gains that are the community, the larger community has made in terms of Medicaid expansions, improvements in food stamps, including uh, uh, rolling back some of the adverse changes in the Welfare Reform Act that were made to food stamps. In uh, the organizing around minimum wage and wage theft, um, the proposals recently put forward to reform unemployment insurance, the gains we've made in um, the child tax credit and, and uh, the ITC have been huge and in many ways um, uh, what's happened over the last 20 years is particularly Medicaid and food stamps have filled a significant part of the gigantic hole that was created by wage declines and and the TANF drop not enough and and we now have a system that's much more generous to the working poor and much less generous to the non-working poor than we had before and that's a fundamental problem um, and we have to solve that problem but there, there, we have made gains, and some of them have been through organizing over the last 20 years. Absolutely. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I appreciate you trying to end us on a Pollyanna note um, as we do look forward to the future. We have reached the end of our time. Jacqueline, I'm so sorry we did not um, get to your question. Um, I want to thank all five of you for joining us today. This was very interesting, um, and I encourage everyone to um, check out their article. And um, there's, here's the title again, uh, 20 Years After Welfare Reform, Reflections and Recommendations from Those Who Were There. You can find that at povertylaw.org slash clearinghouse. Um, we'll also invite you to join our mailing list if you found today's um, topic interesting. We've got a lot more where that came from. You can join our mailing list at povertylaw.org slash join. You can also follow the Shriver Center on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. I want to go ahead and invite you to return and join us for next month's Advocacy Exchange. Next month we'll be talking about the overlap in the Affordable Care Act and the criminal justice system and where there are opportunities to improve health care and um, health care coverage for people in the criminal justice system. It should be very interesting. We'll be talking with um, my colleague at the Shriver Center, Jenny Sutcliffe. Also, Katie Welter from the Chicago Appleseed Fund for Justice and Sarah Summers from the National Health Law Program. That will be on Wednesday, September 14th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And when you get the follow-up email, um, 
to today's uh, event, there will also be a link there where you can go ahead and register for next month's uh, advocacy exchange. I do hope you'll return to join us then. Um, until then, though, remember that you are not alone out there in this work. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.